All right, my friends, happy Sunday to you. We have a very special live stream. We got Dr. Todd Welty and Matthew Pose on here to talk about directional bass. Todd, I'm going to call you the doctor of bass because okay. you're, you're kind of the beginning of multi subwoofer. You're yeah. the one that did the majority of all the different uh, research from Harmon for decades on the benefits of multi sub. So you earned Dr. Bass. Okay. Thank you. Uh, OG. You can also call me OG. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome, man. I've been using multiple subwoofers in my systems for over two decades, and I didn't know all the math behind it initially. I just knew it sounded better. And then you guys came up with these awesome papers. I think you were just doing eigenvalue analysis initially, right? You were doing like MATLAB or something to, to yeah. figure out all the modal behavior of small room acoustics, multi-subs. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I've spoken to Dr. Uh, Floyd Toole, and I think he's the one that gave you the idea to do this because he didn't want to put big bass traps in his room. He wanted a, a way in his own family room to control the modal behavior of his room using active bass traps or subwoofers. Yeah, he definitely got me started on it um, way back. The, the actual beginning uh, goes all the way back to there's a company called California Acoustical Technologies. I, I think mm. they're still around. Um, Cat? They, they, yeah, Cat. They had a, a demo room with 20 subwoofers uh, at, at one of the shows. And we were both just like, okay, what? I mean, do we need 20 subwoofers? Is there any advantage to 20 subwoofers? That seems like a lot. And so he just kind of uh, start, you know, wound me up and pointed me in the right direction and said, okay, well, you better go investigate. So that's kind of what started the whole thing. Very interesting. So what we're going to be talking about in today's live stream is, is directional bass, is it beneficial? Because there are some products coming out now. In fact, I'm in the, I'm currently testing one of them, the Marantz AV10 and Amp10. You can see here, I did a whole video on, on advanced bass management settings that this processor offers. And uh, pretty much all of the newer Marantz and Denon gear that have multiple subwoofer outputs, particularly four subwoofer outputs, are offering this thing called bass redirection, where you could move bass to different zones of the room. So if you've got four subs, you could have a front left, front right, rear right, rear left. And um, you could either set that up as mono, or you could actually have zones of bass go to those different subwoofers. So I said to Matt, I go, this is a good idea to bring Dr. Todd Welty and, and yourself, because we've all been kind of wondering about the research behind uh, directional bass, whether or not it's audible and what test conditions are audible. So I asked Matt to put together this PowerPoint and then also Todd to have your insight here because you've done a lot of research in this area. Well, the, to be clear, the stereo bass thing that we're going to talk about a directional bass is a little different than what Todd had done. But part of how that came about was Todd and I, who message each other quite a bit about random nerdy topics related to acoustics, rarely about multi-sub actually. Um, and he had had the exact same experience I had, which was uh, essentially a run-in with, with uh, Dr. David Greisinger, who um, I think is somebody who really spearheaded a logical approach, at least, to where something like multi-channel or stereo bass could make sense, pushed the idea pretty hard, actually makes a really good, compelling case for it. But both Todd and I had a similar experience of it was really hard to hear the effect. Um, so this presentation will cover, of course, a little bit of the, the tech itself coming out with the, the new Massimo products, but also um, I think, Todd, you and I can talk a little bit about our experience with um, what it is, what exactly it is we're trying to reproduce, and then also how audible that is. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to share the screen here. And somebody's uh, mentioned cardioid subwoofers. I think we should totally get into that later, <laughs> maybe okay. towards the end if we have time. Yep. So directional bait. I don't know if I'm going to be able to control these. Oh yeah, they're not logged in. I could do it for you. Just tell me. That's one fine. All right. Directional bays. Can we detect low frequency direction? And is this a feature we need? This actually came out of one of the papers that was done on this. Um, the reason why the subwoofers are stacked, you'll see there's three of them kind of look like they're in the middle and another one farther to the left. That was actually the different apertures they were trying to create between the center sub position uh, to see how audible direction change was. So obviously that one that's to the left there, that's like the most extreme angle shift. The other three were much smaller angle shifts that they were trying to see if that was audible. Now, when um, you talk about directional bass, what's the bandwidth of the bass? Is it from 20 hertz to 80 hertz? Are you talking about 20 hertz to 200 hertz? What's the span? I mean, it's a little arbitrary. Um, I think that in general, the argument here they're looking at is in that area that we typically bass manage. So probably 80 to 100 hertz. But 
um, as we'll get into a little bit, what the research shows is that there, the ability to detect some sort of physical position for base becomes more and more difficult, more of a dubious process really, as we get lower in frequency. So by like 20 Hertz, for instance, we're just not hearing direction at all at yeah. 150 Hertz. There may be some direction to it at let's say 200 Hertz. Most people probably could locate a subwoofer relatively. Okay. And I think that's why THX came out with the 80 Hertz crossover. Cause I, I, if I remember correctly, they, their research was based on the fact that base was detectable at an octave above that. So at 160 Hertz, it was clearly detectable. So they kind of chose a crossover point at around 80. And uh, it also takes the power strain off of the amplifier as well as uh, off the speakers, the satellite speakers having to produce low frequencies. Todd, what do you think about that? I mean, what was the what was the crux behind the 80 hertz crossover from THX? Was it basically because of the research they were doing on detectability of directionality of, of yeah, what they thought yeah. was being? I'm sure that some of those papers that, that uh, came out that I referenced in my work had, had come out by that time and were indicating that you know, anything below 80 Hertz was probably safe. And um, mm -hmm. so it, it kind of made sense that way. I don't, I mean, I wasn't involved in the decision-making, but it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we'll get a little bit into the psychoacoustics of sound localization. So in the horizontal plane, we rely largely on ITD and ILD. ITD is the um, timing difference, the interval timing difference, and ILD is level difference. PD is phase difference. Um, so ILD dominates in the high frequency cues, ITD dominates in the low frequency cues, and then the phase aspects of it are related and tend to um, support the, the sense of really what I think we call baseness in the very low frequency cues. And I think, Todd, you actually coined that phrase, didn't yeah. you, from some of that work? Yeah, that word. <laughs> yeah. I used it in the paper we wrote too. So why ILD doesn't work at low frequencies? We don't use ILD at low frequencies. The sound diffracts around the head. Basically what happens is that there isn't enough of a level difference once the sound has diffracted around your head like that for mm -hmm. the ear to detect any sort of direction from it. So level difference is not something we can rely on. You can go to the next one though. Um, but timing differences and phase differences we can. Interoral time differences, sound takes a different amount of time to reach one ear versus the other, can perceive the azimuth of an object about the horizon, you can't necessarily tell proximity though. Interoral phase difference at ever lower frequencies of phase shift is more audible than the raw time shift, but these are intertwined phenomena. And actually, I think there were some papers I read that were showing phase differences were quite detectable at uh, pretty high frequencies, including there's sort of a range where the ITD and the ILD overlap, and phase tends to actually be the thing that supports that. Right. Um, so if you have a if you have a phase problem, it may it, it may not show up in an amplitude response measurement, right? If you're trying to set up a system with subwoofers and satellite speakers, or or is the phase difference so drastic that you would see an amplitude response difference? Well, this is talking about phase change between ears, uh, which is a little oh, bit okay. different than what you're talking about. But but to that to the point, I think you're trying to make certainly a subwoofer could be integrated in phase, but not in time which could, I suppose you could argue is a phase issue. Um, so that the amplitude response looks good, but actually is lagging behind or is ahead of uh, the higher frequencies by a substantial amount. Yeah. And Todd, you, you want to say something? I was going to say that, yeah, I've looked into that before. And I, the conclusion I came to is that if, if it was, um, you know, if you had an isolated uh, mode, modal frequency, then it tended to be minimum phase, in which case they, they are linked. But if you had to, two modes close together, then then maybe not. So in that case, you could have, you know, divergences of phase that aren't that aren't reflected in the amplitude. Oh, good point. Right, and and then um, I think actually this is a probably going to get off topic with this one. But a, another thing that's come before is how much of the problems that we're dealing with in rooms is minimum phase or not. The, the kind of generic argument has always been, well, speakers are minimum phase, modes are minimum phase, therefore the room problem is minimum phase. But it, in the stochastic zone, it certainly isn't minimum phase 100%. It's quite a bit of it is not. And at low frequencies, it's a mixed bag, I think is what you're getting at. It just depends. And if you've so got maybe define what stochastic, stochastic zone is so people know. Um, very simply, it's the point at which there aren't these obvious discrete modes, they're actually so close together that they're fully on top of each other. And it's referred to as the statistic zone because the really the only way to kind of understand the way sound is propagating throughout the room is to see the whole field and then looking at the averages of certain phenomena within it. That Todd, is that close enough? Yeah. Yep. 
And then in small rooms, you're looking at anywhere from around 300 to 500 hertz is about right. I think that's often referred to as the upper end of the transition zone. I mean, you've got this FS or um, the kind of uh, low frequency zone that's the hard transition between um, uh, mo the modal region and the stochastic region. But I know uh, Floyd Tools talked about this a lot. It's not like that wasn't really correct. Like if you look at the formula, yes, it gives you this lower bound point, but it's not really true that... Um, that there's just like a hard cutoff between the modal region and the stochastic region. It actually seems to have this transition range. And, and I think Floyd said 300 Hertz, 500 Hertz. I remember emailing him one day. I'm like, what's the number? He goes, I don't know, pick one. I mean, I think there is no number and it, it sort of depends on the room, how much absorption is in the room, the shape of the room. Todd again. So referred to as Schroeder frequency, right? And then yeah. there's an equation for it. And and at some point, the, the the numbers in the equation doubled because I don't know if it was a mistake or it was rethought out. So, I mean, even, you know, it's just so, um, I actually did a lot of the simulations for Floyd when, when he was asking about that. I did a bunch of MATLAB simulations and we both looked at it and said, this is really, it's useful as a concept, but it's not, it's not that useful to look at the exact frequency and make deductions from it. It's just, it's more of a concept really. Yeah. So, so back to this really quick, we'll get to the last point and then we can move on to the next slide. JND is the just noticeable difference. So whenever you're trying to do work like this, you want to try to detect a point at which you hit that just noticeable difference. It's that like minimum angle or minimum level or minimum distortion amount or whatever that a person can notice under either optimal conditions or real world, excuse me, conditions, whatever you're trying to do for the system. So in this case, we were talking about angular shift and there's a certain point at which the distance between our ears will limit what kind of an angular shift we can actually hear at certain frequencies because the ears are basically too close together so that at very, very low frequencies, there's not enough of a shift going on to really make some sense of it. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. All right, ITD and IPD, the interoral time difference sound takes a different amount of time to reach one ear versus the other. Can we pre uh, perceive the azimuth of an object about the horizon? I already said that. Apparently I wrote this twice, sorry guys. <laughs> Interoral phase difference uh, at ever lower frequencies, the phase shift is more audible. I said that too. Did we go the wrong direction? Or did no, I double the slide? I don't think so. Let me go. No. I don't know. I must have doubled the slide for some reason. <laughs> Sorry about that. We can go uh, on. Yeah, we'll skip on. All right. So the difference, uh, distance between ears is typically 5.7 to 6.6 .6 inches on average. Um, so the wavelength of 2093 hertz is 6.5 inches. Um, 261.6 Hertz is 4.3 feet. Your distance is too short to detect it, uh, reliably the direction at 261 Hertz. This was, there was some work that came up with these numbers, but a lot of research has shown that we actually do hear, uh, direction pretty okay at 261 Hertz, but this was just relying solely on this Q and the distance between the ears. Phase locking occurs using bushy cells. Spherical bushy cells dominate at the lowest frequency, such as 200 to 700 hertz. I know that's not like the lowest you can hear, but that was where they were kind of focusing on in the work. Um, one of the things, and Todd, you may know more about this, but it seems like a lot of the research seems to suggest that some of the phenomena below this point, we don't fully understand. Like there seems to be some things going on in how we're able to perceive direction that go against a little bit the theory and kind of go into the there maybe are multiple cues that are being relied on or additional cues that uh, we aren't accounting for. Um, I mean, I think I put this slide in here in part because this was basically saying the human head should create sort of a, a, a lower bound, if you will, to where we could hear. And yet we seem to be able to hear direction below, in this case, like 261 hertz. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't claim to, uh, you know, all the the theory, especially, you know, the current, you know, state of all that theory. But there are some things that that I do know, like for example, that um, you know, your 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 psychoacoustic um, system or your your hearing mechanism is is very adept at um, you know comparing all the different stimuli and when they're in conflict with each other, you know, it it basically gloms onto the things that are not, you know, that are, that are not in conflict and that are clear and sort of disregards the rest. And I, I think that the name for that is plausibility theory. So um, the other, th another thing is um, context, you know, it, it's very good at putting things in context and 
for example, visual, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're getting a bimodal, you know, information, uh, your brain puts all that together, throws out the stuff that doesn't make sense and, and goes with what does. And that makes it, that can make it very complicated to study these things because those, you know, those factors change with, with each situation. So. Well, also, I think, don't we perceive the, the direction of these low frequencies more laterally than we do from front to back? So maybe there's some of that, the position of where the source yeah. is emanating from, and then also the tactile energy. So even if you have a sub crossover at 80 Hertz and it's sitting really close to you, even though you, uh, you can't detect localization of 80 Hertz, you could feel the pressure wave of it, which can actually give you the perception of where the subwoofer is located in the room. I maybe I've heard a bunch of people who have pushed that idea for directional base is that you feel the pressure wave. I can't find any research on that. So if there is some studies that were done where people like surrounded somebody with some sort of directional pressure wave system to kind of come up with thresholds, I'd love to see the article. I tried to look into it so I could include it in this set of slides and I just couldn't find any articles that seem to study it in that way. Well, I'll give you a quick anecdotal thing and then we can move on is um, I recently had one of my sub amps blow out my theater room. So I only had one sub in the rear and I had two subs up front. I know it's a first world problem, <laughs> but when that other sub failed, I raised the, uh, the general subwoofer level of all three subs to compensate. I could clearly tell that that sub was behind me by not having that extra sub. As soon as when I got the amp replaced, having two subs in the rear on opposite corners or near opposite corners, not quite opposite corners, but close. It feels like it virtualized the base. So now I couldn't tell that there were four subs. It just sounded like the base was unified in the room. So I don't know how to actually explain that hundred percent, but it was very, maybe the modal behavior was not as good by having an odd number of subs in, in the room when you're supposed to have, you know, multiple even subs. Maybe that it wasn't controlling the modal behavior as well, but I could clearly tell that there was a sub playing behind me where I can't now that I have all four subs working. What do you think? What do you think about that, Todd? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely possible. But to your earlier statement that, you know, in reviewing some of the literature, that it did definitely seem like um, the front to back is more of a is more difficult to con to perceive and which makes a lot of sense with like Kona confusion and all those sorts of things that. Uh -huh. Kind of makes sense that a lateral uh, difference would be easier to to uh, to localize. Yeah, yeah, I actually had noticed some of the studies that I was looking up had shown that there were issues when they would put subwoofers in front and behind, and they would switch back between the two. There was a like a reversal that was taking place, and this is something that happens in headphones sometimes too, where the image instead of sounding like it's coming in front of you, sounds like it's coming from behind you, and without certain cues, uh, head tracking. Um, uh, proper HRT, things like that. Like sometimes there is this reversal. Well, apparently subwoofers will do that too, just in a room, if you put, put them in front and behind. And so they were saying that that was a, an issue, but where left to right was concerned, there seemed to be more ability to detect that. I also recall, Todd, that you had maybe written something a very long time ago. Um, on, I think you had done a study trying to look at the detectability of, of base positions or something like that. I read something that where somebody had said like, when one subwoofer was in the room and then you detected like where it was coming from, people could detect it up to a certain point pretty readily. But the moment you put two in there producing a monophonic signal, they couldn't really tell where the bass was coming from anymore. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. I mean, in my study, which maybe we'll get to later, but they did have the choice of like the front center and then the left and right. And, and, and um, yeah, it was, it was very difficult for people to hear the difference. Yeah. yeah, and another benefit of, of having two subs instead of one, especially if you put them up front, is you can raise that crossover point a little bit and still not detect the subwoofers, whereas if it's just one sub, it becomes more localizable. That's been my experience when I set up systems for people. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, the limits of biology. I feel like we covered this one, too. I'm going to say let's go ahead and move on. We covered okay. a lot of this is kind of related to the stuff we already got into. So. Is there a hard limit for the just noticeable difference of ITD at low frequencies? So it seems like there is no established hard limit, um, it but it does worsen as frequencies go lower. So the ability to detect angle as we uh, get lower and lower in frequency gets worse and worse and worse. This is why, for instance, crossing over at 80 hertz is a safe bet because it was, it was noticed in these early studies that it was getting worse. So very few studies looked below 250 hertz though. That was a problem in looking at these. Obviously some did, but 
trying to look at things like the just noticeable difference specifically, a lot of times they just kind of stop looking after 250 hertz, which makes it kind of hard to know what happens below that if they didn't bother to study it. This is another one of those things where I'll sometimes bug Todd and be like, how come they didn't look below that? And he'll, he'll remind me that, you know, a lot of times these researchers have a limited amount of time and they got to get something done. They have a very specific goal and it may not be to entertain me and include all the little things I would have liked to see them study. Hmm. Um, so studies show the detectable shift in azimuth worsens. I already said that while, while the head uh, width doesn't set the low frequency azimuth limit as expected, it does establish a kind of mountain to overcome. In other words, there does become a point where the, essentially the distance between ears is, is creating not an insurmountable boundary, but a sort of boundary where we start to see a much uh, more difficult uh, detectability. And you can see that I've got some of the graphs on the right there. I mean, you can see that as it gets to like 100 hertz, the little boxes that are showing up in the circles there, they're farther from the line. There's less of them. That's because it was getting to a point where people couldn't detect it anymore. By 80 hertz, the azimuth shifts are largely considered imperceptible. This was supported by studies such as Benjamin 2006, Berenius et al. 2005, I probably mispronounced that, I apologize. Um, Welty, who we have here, 2004. And then I have this one note. Welty found that the side subwoofers could allow subtle discernment of direction, but multiple mono gave similar non-localization performance. So that must be what I was referring to that I think was in your paper in 2004, Todd. Does that sound familiar or did I misread it? Uh, side subwoofers could allow subtle discernment of directions. I mean, it, it, I guess it depends what you're comparing to what. I mean, it's it's all relative. In my study, they were they were comparing different um, uh, subwoofer configurations, and they were they weren't really localizing. They weren't giving any feedback on localization. It was just whether they could hear the difference or not. Okay, I'm going to throw another thing out there. Is in none of these studies that I'm seeing so far does it tell you the the slope of the low pass filter because that means a lot. It's the out of band energy that you need to filter. If it's only a second order filter as opposed to a fourth order or a sixth order, that could definitely change your perception of base because the the base doesn't just stop at eighty hertz, right? If you cross it over at eighty hertz, yeah, it rolls off. Yeah. So that'll Especially, be our next study. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to say also that another thing that comes up is um, particularly with ported subwoofers is is there if there's any distortion or or port port noise or anything that could mm -hmm. go up in higher in frequency and maybe be localizable. Yeah. I've often wondered about when people say they can localize subwoofers. I mean, one of the really tricky things that you have to be very careful of. In fact, there were some studies I found that did find pretty strong localization, but they didn't, in my opinion, do a very good job making sure that there weren't other things going on that could have caused that. So like port noise, mechanical noises from the driver itself, uh, distortion, you know, all of that's going to be much higher in frequency. And in this one study, I mean, it was kind of compelling when you read through it. And then I noticed that in one of the particular comparisons they did, they didn't include one of the, I think it was like one of the output levels that they had tried to look at just noticeable differences for because the subwoofer was in gross distortion. And when I looked at the output level, it wasn't that loud. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that is, that was pretty bad distortion, but like there, you probably need to establish a threshold at which distortion needs to be below before you could say that that's not causing some sort of detectability, because if we're talking about third or fourth harmonics, that's going to be way up in frequency. You know, if you're testing 80 Hertz and now we've got people that are looking at like 240 Hertz distortion, that's only, let's say 15 dBs down from the level that they're testing at, which might be like 85 or 90 dBs, that very well could be loud enough that it would help somebody detect where a subwoofer is coming from. So those are all issues. And I think from a practices research, from a practical standpoint, like we need to make sure our subwoofers are operating correctly, are of competent design and are operate, you know, are clean, that they're not making a lot of noises or they are gonna probably be uh, detectable. Yeah. Well, Matt, I have a question about all these studies. Is this done just with subwoofers or are there other speakers playing? Because if there's full range speakers playing in this study, that could cause a masking effect too, right? So you might not be able to localize the bases easily if you're just isolating base only. I mean, Todd did one of them, so he can tell you what they did. But the one that had pictures that I saw had some full range speakers. I, I doubt they were actually running bass, though. I kind of split the difference um, in my study. I had people listening to only the subwoofers as a training session so they could hear what it was they were listening to. But then in the actual test, it was full range. So, yeah. Was there a difference? Was there a masking effect once you went full range and had, you know, it wasn't just you listening to 80 hertz and below, but you were listening to the entire spectrum of music? Yeah, I'm sure there there is some. There's there's got to be some. Yeah. 
And then also, is it is it more detectable with test tones than it is with actual dynamic oh, material? We can we can get into that, and it, you know, maybe I'll wait till you're done with your presentation because yeah. that's that's a very interesting subject which I would love to talk about. Okay. Whenever whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right. So here's the dissenting findings that I was talking about. Um, so in this 2004 study, conduct uh, they looked at very low frequencies, 31 and a half hertz, 63 hertz, and 125 hertz with subwoofers in the standard five-speaker arrangement. In other words, like a 5.1 system, but instead of 5.1, it was just five channels, and they just put subwoofers there to kind of see. And they actually said people could readily detect the left, center, and right direction, but it was hardest at the lowest frequencies, like 31.5 hertz. Front and rear was not possible, so they could not hear front to back differences. Um, and it was unclear why ITD, oh, it was unclear why, but they indicated they thought ITD was likely a factor. They did note that the room at low frequencies had a RT60 time of 0.2 seconds. So I'll just point out wow, that's that really that means good. that it was probably largely devoid of low frequency reflections of any significant amount. If the RT60 time at these low frequencies was that low, that's really low. That's hard to measure, isn't it? It, it is. It is possible. Um, and they I think they were testing in a semi-anechoic chamber. Or yeah, I think chamber so. Or something. So um, I would argue that reflection, I mean, reflections are like additional sources in a room and they give directional cues themselves. I would argue that if you've got stronger reflections, I would assume that that would mask to some extent the perception of, of direction at low frequencies. I don't Todd, if you have thoughts on that. I mean, I, at those frequencies, I don't really, I don't really think about reflections so much because the wavelength is, you know, as large as a room or, you know, approaching the size of the room. So I, I, I tend not to think of them as discrete reflections. But I mean, maybe decay rate, just you know, the base overhang kind of thing. Yeah, they're delay. It's delayed acoustical energy, I guess you could call it. And and yes, but but I think mean, yes, I agree that does, it's, it's, it has to have an effect. I mean. You know, and I think that the Nastasha, I was looking through that uh, Nastasha thesis. I think that was anechoic as well. Mm -hmm. The one that found in favor of directional base. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess, you know, for sure. And, an, you know, when you have no room modes, no reflected energy or anything, then I can totally believe that, that they're, you know, that you could have directional base. But I mean, we don't listen in, in those types of rooms. Yeah. And let's be clear. Nobody, no consumer that I know has a 0 0.2 uh, second decay time at low frequencies. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think, that's, a, that's, a, that's almost anechoic. Yeah. It's really low. I think the lowest I've typically ever measured is maybe 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. And those are heavily damped, typically yeah, pretty small rooms, a lot. very lossy walls. Uh, so Greisinger has figured, you know, found similar things in the past that, yeah, Nastasa uh, thesis was done. So that's actually the one I was talking about. If you look at that one, a couple of the tests had to be eliminated because the subwoofers were distorting, mm -hmm. which makes me question and some of the other tests. I understand that they were checking distortion, but I just, it, what was the threshold, you know, where they decided that this was too much? And I looked at the subwoofers. I couldn't tell them the make and model, but they look like kind of low end, small pro audio subs. They mm -hmm. may not have been able to produce 31.5 Hertz, particularly loudly without distortion. Yeah. And they might've been kind of noisy and, I think especially in an anechoic chamber that probably would have been more audible and yeah. might have contributed to detecting cues totally all right so why do some studies find in favor and some against um so some were more focused on lateralization than localization it's uh it is uh well known that lateralization to a point at least is audible that's that idea that the bass sounds like it's coming from outside of your head instead of in your head that was david's thing and i don't think anybody disagrees with his views on that to a point. I think where the disagreement comes in is it, it, at what frequency does it really matter anymore? You know, is the lateralization really happening more in the upper base range or does it really matter all the way down to like 31.5 Hertz? And I think that's at least from my perspective, that's where things start to kind of fall apart. Um, many factors play into localization, including vibrations, harmonics, and inharmonic noises. None of the studies were very good. They all had small samples, poor controls, et cetera. I mean, Todd's was pretty good, but you know, the others. Mine had a small sample though. <laughs> I'm shocked when I read it again, I'm like crap, how did I end up with only five subjects? I, I think they all must've been busy at the time and I couldn't get anybody else, but they were trained listeners. I will say. Yeah. And yeah so that's a, important. That's important part. to note. Uh, real quick, Matt. So Harmon does this thing where they train the listeners in their blind tests and they go through a pretty extensive program. So the listeners could understand tonality and they know what a reference, what, you know, neutral sound is. Right. I mean, Todd, it, it makes a huge difference in, in creating consistency with your yeah. listening test when you train a listener. 
yeah, we have a training program and, and, and a lot of on the job training. Cause we, you know, we run a lot of tests. So that's. Yeah. And then I think this last point I made uh, is actually Todd, what you were getting at, which matters, which is localization and directional determination may also be content dependent. In other words, test tones yep. may be a different matter. And there's of course, different types of test tones than music. Yes. All right. We can yeah. go on. To... No, go ahead. Sorry, no. Todd, what were you going to say? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, in, in my study, um, I don't know. Do you want to finish your presentation? Then we can talk about my study a little bit or. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Or... All right. So this is going on to the Den and Morant stuff. So they've added directional base. Uh, they've updated the software to allow directional base management bases directed to subwoofers that match the direction it is coming from in the channel matrix. So we have to think of this as zones rather than like specific spe speaker locations, but think left, right, or left front, right front, yeah. uh, left rear, right rear, something like that. It supports front, back, side, or four corners. And now, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is this a good thing? Is this something we actually want? And I think the answer is maybe. And I did test it with the audio precision. You could see it in my video. Um, it really does route the bass from the closest speaker to that, or from the closest speaker to that subwoofer. So it's pretty advanced, the amount of processing that had to add to this product in order to do this. So you got to give them credit on that. Just because you can do a thing doesn't necessarily follow that you must do that thing. Yeah, and that's there, what we're going to be determining. I do think that there's some use for this. So Trinov has an idea um, in their processor, and I it wasn't totally clear to me. I think you could do this with the Den and Morantz, but I, the, Gene, you have one, so I'll have to kind of play with this idea. But let's just say you have overhead speakers. And I mean, Todd, you've probably seen some of this testing too. When you do like output testing, it's very free. So the tweeter is often one of the limiting factors, but the woofer itself is probably the biggest limiting factor. Even though 80 hertz isn't that low, a lot of speakers really can't produce reference levels, let's say at 80 hertz. And so mm -hmm. let's just say you've got an overhead speaker and it's just a typical coaxial in ceiling speaker and you've got it crossed at 80 hertz. I, I don't think most people would have issues with this, but we'll just pretend you have big, tall ceilings in a fairly large room and those speakers are a bit overwhelmed. And maybe they're not able to produce that 80 hertz to the level they need to. What Trinov lets you do is say, okay, so for those overhead speakers, we're going to tie them to another speaker that's going to handle the bass. But they don't mean like 20 hertz to 80 hertz. What they really mean is more like 80 hertz to 200 hertz, something like mm -hmm. that. Which at that point, that's going to be noticeable if not done correctly. And especially if you just tie those over to a, a mono subwoofers, there is some directional information that could be lost. But if you're able to tie it to general directional zones, then that information maybe isn't lost. So I could see a scenario, for instance, where overhead speakers are tied to subwoofers at a higher crossover point, and that could be very useful. I think wholly separate from really what we're talking mostly about here, which is the idea of like all the speakers are essentially running directional base and that we're somehow hearing that. Yeah, I mean, in that case, I would say get better speakers because if your speaker can't handle the output at 200 hertz, then it's it's not commensurate with the rest of the speakers in your setup, right? I mean, I would see a 100 hertz crossover for an in-ceiling speaker is, is doable, but man, 200 hertz. Well, I just made the 200 hertz yeah. up. As a no, but I get what you're saying. Point. Yeah, I mean, no, you can't you can't route bass from a speaker to another speaker on the Morantz. You can only route... But you can route to the zone subwoofers, which might give a similar subwoofer. effect. Yeah, yeah, but the subwoofer itself is crossed over at 80. Well, it's a complex network, so it will pass higher frequencies if you route with multiple crossovers. But I, I would caution people to run um, 200 hertz to a subwoofer because I feel like you would localize that at that point. It, it may be 125 hertz instead. I don't yeah. know. All yeah, right, I mean, well, let's but go ahead. Maybe, sorry, maybe there's some, some, some safe zone where... It's above 80, but it's below 160 or something. Maybe there's some something you can do in that area. And particularly if you're if you're moving, if you're strategically moving stuff around to try to offset, you know, maybe there's some kind of clever thing you can do, but but it's gotta have limits. I mean look, this may not be a popular option, but in most cases, if I was putting a kick-ass home theater in for someone, I would tell them to go with eight inch instead of six inch um, speakers for Atmos, just because it gives you a sensitivity sensitivity boost play output, you know, higher output, because those speakers are usually further away from the listener than the rest of the speakers in your setup, especially from your surround speakers, right? So go with a bigger speaker in the ceiling if you can handle having a bigger grill. 
Yeah, I mean, it. I think it really is a complex issue. The, the issue you then run into, and this is up to the speaker designer to handle it properly, is that if it's a two-way kind of typical coaxial design, it's often hard to get an eight-inch woofer that can match up with like a one-inch tweeter in terms of the directivity. And so you end up with some beaming at the upper end of the woofer where it has to cross over to the tweeter that causes some off-axis issues, which Gene, I have to show you some data later on a common speaker we have that has this issue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, and so I, to me, it's a balancing act of the larger woofer gives you a bit more output at the low end. Sometimes you get a little bit of a sensitivity boost. On the other hand, it may actually affect some of the more important stuff going on in that crossover region. All right, so we're off topic though, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this diagram was floating around quite a bit. Um, hopefully this is helpful, but it kind of explains how things are routed in quadrants. So the claim is perception of concussive effects, feel the direction of vibrations. This is, Gene, what you were talking about before. I've heard this term a lot, concussive effects or feeling concussive effects or directional concussive effects. I'm not totally sure outside of like AVS forum where this came from. And as I said, I tried to find some studies that supported it or looked into it. And I just had a really hard time finding studies that were, were at least close enough to this to be something that you could use as like evidence to support it. I think mm. it's an interesting idea. I think it would be interesting to try to test it. I'm not sure how you would isolate the concussive effect from the sound itself. That would probably be like a critical part of this. Um, the claim uh, also is that hearing direction of bass findings on perception of direction is flimsy. As I said, it's not totally clear that you can hear directional bass below a certain point. The room seems to need to be very highly damped for this to be perceived. Even Greisinger work, Greisinger's work had found that especially, I think it was medial modes, tend to disrupt the uh, lateralization effect pretty badly. Unclear what is being perceived. As I said, it could be distortion. It could be motor noise. It could be all sorts of things that are not what we think it is and are not actual base. And then optional setups, not ideal for directional base. So um, uh, remember that most of the studies that found perception of direction required subs at 90 degrees to the listener and front to back could not be perceived. So sometimes the multi-sub approach where we kind of set up subs ideally um, for the best distribution tends to actually have less value for this directional base setup, which would tend to be probably a left and a right sub at the midpoint of the walls. So we can go on to the next one. So then this becomes a Todd question at some point. Is it better to have better directionality of bass or is it better to have better modal control of bass so every seat gets a consistent sound of bass? Come on, dude. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've always, I always call it the 600 pound gorilla in the room. Um, you know, if you've got one person who who's getting slammed and one person who's you can't hear anything. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but I mean, that's, it's, yep. such, it's such a huge effect and compare that to something rather subtle. If, if at all, you know, there's just no, there's, you, you just can't really compare them. I mean, it's for me, that that's my there's nothing worse than sitting in a home theater, whether it's your own or someone else's and you get a different experience in base, just moving from one seat to the other. Yep. That, that kills me. Now, if you can get them both, I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, maybe well, there's nothing wrong with that. I, and I think that there's tech quickly coming on the market that may have that capability, uh, which is, you know, another presentation we need to probably do. Um, so anyway, this is just talking about the trade-offs. And this is, we, we basically, Todd just answered exactly what this was getting at. I mean, when people were actually given the choice of essentially the, the distributed subwoofer is giving, you know, the, we'll call it the greatest excitation of the modes, which allowed for the smoothest possible and most even base, they preferred that to the directional base cues, um, which may have been audible, but it was very, very subtle. Um, and it's not just Todd's study that found this. There were others. I, you know, I mentioned an older one by Teal and Kugler. Um, it, there's been various others. And I've talked a lot about Dr. Earl Geddes, who was somebody who was a, a mentor for me for a long time on this. He's pointed this out as well. Um, at the end of the day, modes are also very deleterious to base directionality in the first place. So if we can't get rid of those, whatever effects we're getting from detecting direction are not really fully being realized or we're not benefiting from it. And so as Todd said, like, if we could have both, there's probably nothing wrong with that. That would be great. Current technology maybe isn't fully there. Go ahead, Todd. I've, you know, this idea has been floating around. I remember discussing it with Alan Devantier, you know, 15 years ago, but could you have some kind of a, um, 
don't know if it'd be an encoder or a decoder, but some, a, a device that would basically look at your, say it's a stereo um, signal, look at the, it would basically split it into a, a correlated part and a decorrelated part. And the correlated mm -hmm. part, which uh, when we get into in a minute or two talking about, you know, um, program material for these tests, I think mo it, it's more tending to be correlated than decorrelated. It's hard to find decorrelation. But um, so if you took the correlated part, split it off and ran that into, you know, your uh, whatever your base optimi optimization routine is. And then if there is a decorrelated part, split that out and treat it differently. Try, try to do some kind of a, if there, you know, whatever your spatial base uh, regime is, maybe there's some way that you could, you know, split that signal and treat it differently, depending on whether it's correlated or not. That would be an interesting Thing. And the other thing is, I think you you brought up the idea of well, you said canceling reflections, which you know again, I don't I don't tend to think of reflections, but it, it brings up like something like a double base array or some some active absorbers that you mentioned. And what what if you could make the room you know less reverberant that way, and then maybe the spatial base becomes more possible and the room modes less of a problem. So that's two different ways. That yep. maybe you can approach and that. so. Of the tech I was talking about, Durac's new system, the active room treatment approach that they have does apparently allow for this. We can debate how well it works. I think, you know, until everybody's tested it thoroughly, it's hard to really make any comments about the effectiveness. But the concept is that it's canceling, uh, well, I'm going to still call them reflections, <laughs> the, the base that is bouncing off of a wall and then feeding back into the signal somewhere else in the room and creating constructive, destructive interference of some kind. It's, it's uh, canceling that before that happens um, and then creates the sort of anechoic like base environment um, and then still allows some steering in, in the way that it works in terms of directionality. Uh, the other system that's on the market uh, from Trinov, um, which has not really been fully released yet, actually uses DBAs as one of the approaches, but that's really more about uh, sort of beam steering or creating a, a a focused, we'll call it beam of base that doesn't reflect off of the walls. And then as Mark Seaton likes to refer to it, there's a catch at the back of the room. So essentially a cancellation that takes place before it can bounce off the back wall and create that launch tuna mode. When I've talked to them about directionality, what they've basically said is no, <laughs> the system doesn't do that. And they pointed out one potential problem, which I think is where you know, you might wonder, is direct, direct have this? And that is anytime you cancel out those reflections and then feed back in an additional signal that's highly correlated with the one you just canceled, um, you are now recreating the mode you just got rid of. Hmm. So yeah. there then becomes this kind of uh, reciprocal problem of your canceling and then recanceling a mode constantly trying to create direction. So their argument seems to be, well, all of this is so inaudible for the most part anyway. And the smoothness, basically the lack of modes is such a more important factor. Why focus on recreating the directionality? Your idea though, of splitting off the decorrelated part, I think is an interesting one. And I think this is where David is kind of the person to then bring back into the equation. Cause I actually think the problem with all that lies at the recording studio more than anything else. They're just, as I understand it from him, that's something that the mix engineers need to make a conscious choice about when they're mixing. And it's just not something that I think they're even that aware of. Well, you know, um, actually the Morans does do that for you already. If you think about how this base management is working, the decorrelated base is basically routing base from whatever speaker is next to that subwoofer, right? So a left front speaker, the base will go to that left front, but the LFE signal is going to go to all four subs. So that's correlated. So you're well, still getting a mono LFE summed modal control of that base, but you're not getting the benefit of multi-sub modal control for the channel to channel base. Yeah. That base is probably still highly correlated. So if you were to actually take the recording itself and let's say low pass filter it. So you're only looking at what's happening below like hundred Hertz. Um, what you typically find is that if you were to look at the correlation of the low frequencies in the left and right channel, or if it was surround, let's say, in all the uh, all the bed layer channels, you, you'd find it's basically the same, it's highly correlated. Um, there, there would have to be a, essentially a phase shift and in, it, it's uh, integrated into it. It's the way I think about it, and it's only because David had pointed out that his lexicon reverb processor does this, is it's sort of like adding reverb at low frequencies to create yeah. that perception. And that's something an engineer would have to mix in. And as far as I know, they, they don't typically do that. 
Todd, do you have more? You know, not to get off topic, but we should probably bring back John Trownweiser again, who who mixes yeah. at most movies for a living, and ask him, are you sending full range bass explosions to a particular speaker, or is the bass below 80 hertz being monosum to all the you know to the subwoofers or to all the speakers? We don't really know 100 percent how that is from movie to movie. So that could really affect the result here as well, right? Depending on how it's mixed. Or even in spatial audio music. It always seems to come back to the circle of confusion in some <laughs> shape or form, right? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, what I was going to say is that um, with the correlation, when I found something very interesting when I was doing my study, where I, I actually I purposely wanted to find uh, loops that had decorrelation in the left and right channel, and so I took a bunch of loops that had lots of low frequency energy, and I. I plotted out, you know, on a, a instantaneous basis, the, the decorrelation in left and right channel. And what I found with many of them, or most of them, is that in the instance of time when the left and right were decorrelated, there was hardly any base energy. And when they were, when there was lots of base energy, it was correlated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not even, it, it, it's, it's, it's a second by second sort of thing, right? I mean, it's not even, you have to really break it down and look and see where is this decorrelation happening? Um, that, that's, so that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I was surprised. Yeah. So you could put a ton of money basically into this fancy piece of DSP that's going to strip off the decorrelated part, and then there'd be nothing for it to actually yeah, right. reproduce. Or actually. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Well, we can move on to the next slide. If there, I don't know what I have on here. All right. So the directional base hurts base quality. Oh, yeah. So Massimo indicates that Odyssey has been updated to correct each subwoofer with directional base. So for those who are wondering, as far as I understand, Odyssey has been set up and optimized for this new directional base setup. Dirac doesn't have any facilities for doing that. And the new version of the uh, base control that they have, not ART, but the one below it, the base control that can do up to, I think, four subwoofers is not supported by the new Denim Morantz as of now. They may add that later. I think that's how they put it. Um, it the, the directional base approach can't fix mode. So there's no way for it to have that benefit that Todd basically described in his seminal paper. And That's it, weird because Odyssey typically would, um, it would set level and phase for each sub independently, but then it would do global EQ to all four subs. Are you saying that behavior has changed? I have no idea what they did. Oh, they okay. just said that they optimized it for it. I mean, it, they didn't make clear how it works. Yeah. Um, let's see. Would require an RT time below 0.2 seconds below 150 hertz to damp the modes. I mean, I, you know, we can debate great. if it has to be exactly that low, but the point being like, if you're really going to get to a point where you can hear these directional cues and we're going to try to stay consistent with what the research showed, you're going to need to have a pretty, uh, dry room at low frequencies. And most people don't really have that. No. You get no benefit of the multiple subwoofers on modes as mentioned, no benefit of mutual coupling outside of the LFE. I mean, one of the things you get when you put four subwoofers, let's say one in each corner, besides the gain from the corner itself, is that if they're all uh, getting a correlated signal, you're probably going to get about what three or four decibels of, of extra output uh, for each doubling of subwoofers yeah. uh, in a scenario like that, which is useful. Get a little headroom there when you're doing directional bass like this, unless they're all getting a correlated signal, that's not true anymore. So you're just getting the output of the one subwoofer because it's the only one reproducing the signal. Um, and a lot of people's systems frequently are kind of under woofered, if you will. They don't really have enough headroom in the subwoofer to really handle those, those big dynamics. So losing that could be problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, 115 dBs is really loud. And that's the maximum that potentially could have to be reproduced by a subwoofer in a room. Um, and let's see, table is MSV of different subwoofers versus seat location. I think this came from your paper, Todd. Yep. Yep. So this was the uh, variation by, this was just to kind of point out, you know, that you get a lot more benefit typically with a multi-sub approach and reducing that variation seat to seat. Yep. All right. We can, there we go. What about lateralization? So we previously reported on experiments with lateralization, the perception of base outside our head. That's the Greisinger uh, theory and research I've talked about. Oh, go ahead, Todd. I I'll stop you there for a second. Um, yeah, I saw that. Um, I mean, lateralization is normally referring to uh, the, the movement of sound in, as when it's perceived in the head. I don't know if, if maybe Griesinger is using that term in a different way, or maybe uh, maybe other people are. But Oh, externalization, I think, is what I meant to write. Uh, I thought it was externalization. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good point. No worries. Um, 
uh, let's see, back to what I was trying to say, barely perceptible, but now, oh yeah. So um, the externalization of base though, that he he promotes um, is something that Todd, you've, you've had an opportunity to hear his demo set up. I've had an opportunity to hear them. It's really hard to hear. Mm -hmm. um, con the contrived test tones, it was pretty audible under the right conditions, but like still a subtle effect. Yeah. The music, I couldn't hear it at all with music. Yeah, me neither. Um, let's see, was not a dominant factor of bass quality. So when I listen to music and I, you know, basically listen to, we'll call it like A being tracks, one that had the bass fully correlated, the other one that had the decorrelated bass left in there. I didn't listen to like each of those and say, this clearly sounds better than this. Besides the fact that I couldn't really hear a difference at all in that, even with those test tones, it just sounded different. One didn't sound more correct than the other. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, uh, room modes disturb this very easily, especially the medial mode. That's like the middle mode down the room, uh, in the middle of the room. And it's hard to find music that's compatible. This is what we were talking about before, which is that it, a lot of music doesn't actually have decorrelated bass. So because of that, the externalization effect can't be recreated. But I do want to be clear that this is real audible phenomena. He's not completely nuts. Um, and it very well could be a key part of realism. It's just that we have to balance that against all the other issues going on in a room. Um, and that 90 degree subwoofer arrangement was the only one that worked well for me when I played around with this. So I couldn't get it to work for the longest time. He sent me all the tracks, told me what to do. At one point he had me setting up a stereo in my bathroom. Um, <laughs> He had had better luck with that apparently in his house and he thought I would too. And uh, eventually what I did was just way over damp the room and then put matching subwoofers on the left and the right wall, midpoint, just 90 degrees to me. And they were given a stereo signal. And then I had the normal left, right speaker set up as usual. And, uh, and then I played the tones and everything. And with the tones, I could hear it. With music, for the most part, I couldn't. There was some stuff he had sent me that was more like no, like musical noise signals, we'll call them. They were also contrived, though. And those, the effect was slightly audible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, Todd, you said that he spent hours and hours and hours trying to set it up for you guys. And it just was really hard to hear the effect. I actually used uh, one of the four test signals I used in my study was, was this warble tone. And um, yeah, and I mean, not only is it contrived, but in my study, I actually... Um, selected the the frequencies for this warble tone to match the modes of the room that I was in so I really wanted to give it every opportunity to be to be audible and it was audible but at the end of the day it was still this very contrived signal which is interesting that but we it's not yeah you know, we don't listen to that so yeah you don't listen to a lot of warble tones in your music <laughs> no uh, so active room treatments, uh, actively canceling reflections has the effect of making a room effectively anechoic. I mean, if you can completely eliminate all of those reflections off a wall, um, it's kind of like listening to bass outside. Removing reflections removes the modes because they're not able to be produced anymore. Uh, localization and directionality may become perceptible in these scenarios. This is kind of what these folks are testing out in the anechoic chambers. Although even anechoic chambers, for the most part, aren't really anechoic at really low frequencies. Um, and the method to cancel base reflections is undermined if directional base is uh, refed. And that's what I was talking about earlier, that when you take and you use essentially the speakers to actively cancel the sound that's coming at that speaker at that point in time and space, and then you recreate the, let's say, left base decorrelated signal it's supposed to produce and send that back into the room, the mode can end up uh, resurfacing. So then with these systems, at least the way they function, it would try to actively cancel that as well. And so you end up in this cycle. As I understand it, what really happens is, is that they're both, both of these systems are trying to find optimal, elegant uh, mm -hmm. solutions, which means the shortest possible FIR filter it can come up with that solves the problem. In this scenario, it creates these really long FIR filters. Uh, they have a lot of taps in them and it ends up causing ringing. And so then the system has to kind of have some safeguards in it to prevent that. And so ultimately what you end up with is something that's sort of on the edge of creating some other problems that are probably much worse than the directional base issue. Uh, the, the lack of directional base, I should say, was in the first place. So what you're saying basically is direct art is incompatible with a directional base scheme. I wouldn't say it's incompatible. I think it's actually the most compatible tech we probably have for it. I would just say that there is this potential, just like FIR filters have the potential for ringing, yeah. which may not be, you know, a good thing. And so you've got to kind of balance it. And, and Dirac has done a really good job trying to make sure that the 
uh, FIR filters that it creates as part of its mixed base solution don't ring. Well, um, what do you mean by that? Because FIR filters are are by nature stable. They don't they don't ring. I mean, they can have long latencies. I guess that's probably what you mean. Pre ringing. Right? Sorry. Oh, okay. Pre ringing. Ah. Well, Sorry, it should have been more clear. Pre pre ringing. They're prone to pre ringing when they get to be particularly complex. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah so. Yeah. So as I understand it from the folks at Dirac, if their system didn't have sort of the safeguards they put in to optimize it, it would create filters which pre-ring. And then uh, Trinov, same thing. There's actually in the setup, there's a feature you can click where it has pre-ringing protection or not. So sort of up to you if you want to prevent it from doing that. Uh -huh. um, and you get a much smoother response if you turn that off, I should say. I think I'm guessing that the pre-ringing is it's not a, a byproduct of the, of the FIR filter. It's a byproduct of the designing how it does comes up with the FIR filter. I'm guessing. Anyway, I, yes, I believe that. Yes, yeah. how it designs the filter, it ends up having pre-ringing and yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that this was Sean's kind of anti-direct thing for a long time was that the filters rang, but or pre-ring, I should say, but but they don't actually. They've done a very good job preventing it from doing that. Mm -hmm. um, it just limits the extent to which it can fully correct every possible problem going on. Right. Um, let's see. So what should you do? Oh, gosh, this is the one right. I guess we couldn't read Matt that. I didn't with that fix. small text. I can't read that. <laughs> so, well, basically, the gist of this is that, you know, I'm saying the wonderful thing about a free society is that you have the ability to make these choices for yourself. In other words, nobody's coming in and telling you that you need to listen to us, for instance, and not use directional base. I think it's very clear that Todd, for instance, would prefer that you use the multi-sub approach, which is summing to mono the base below a certain point. I would support that view. That tends to be what I have found in my experience to be more beneficial. If you would like to try something else, you can. There's nobody stopping you from doing that. And I think you should. You should try it and see what you think. And if you prefer it, good for you. And the really nice thing about these new products is they actually have presets where you could use and actually compare the two. So you could yeah. optimize one using a multi-sub approach with the sum to mono base. And you can have another preset that gives you directional base and you can go back and forth to your heart's consent. So that was, that's the presentation. Cool. I, I have to wonder if there's a little, some element of training yourself to appreciate, like, you know, with this, uh, you know, listening to Dave's demo and all, and all, I just, I had to wonder whether, you know, do I need to train my ear to hear this? And once I do, maybe I, maybe I could, maybe I would appreciate it or something. Maybe I just, I've never heard it before and I'm sure he would probably agree with that, that, that it's something since you never hear it, you don't, you're not aware of it. And once you are, maybe, maybe then it becomes, it, it's still hard to create though. I mean, it, that always comes back to that, but. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's what, again, that's like, to me, the hard to create thing goes back to, well, we just need to talk to David more because he seems to really understand this better than most. And I'm sure there's other people like David who have a really good understanding of exactly what this is in the natural world and how to recreate it artificially in multi-track recordings. Um, and I do know that he is a great aficionado of symphony music. He's He goes to the symphony, I think, pretty much all the time and has for probably the last 40 plus years. And um, I think probably is highly attuned to things like this. As you pointed out, you and I not so much. Um, I tend to listen to multi-track recordings, mostly. Uh, a lot of rock, blues, jazz, things like that. Most of that is recorded in such a way where unless it was artificially added, the decorrelated bass is not going to be there. And so, you know, hearing that effect, uh, you know, is, is not going to happen. And so, yeah, I'm not used to it. Yeah. So my, my viewpoint is I've always liked setting up large speakers for stereo for two reasons. One, you have more dynamic range typically if the speaker is well executed. But I also feel like I, I hear stereo bass, but what, I'm really, what I've realized over the years is it's probably the bass above 80 hertz that I'm more receptive to because by having a large speaker as opposed to a bookshelf with a sub, you have more sensitivity you know, above 80 Hertz coming with all that bass coming from those large speakers. Cause now you got multiple drivers sharing the load. So you have more dynamic range from what your subwoofer is doing all the way out to a couple of hundred Hertz now, as opposed to a small sub sat system. So I think a lot of the perception that audiophiles hear about directional bass is probably coming from the bass above 80 Hertz. That's my viewpoint. Makes sense. You know, I don't know what you think about that. 
It sounds I guess you could, use, you could use a large satellite speaker, a multi-driver large satellite speaker, base manage it and have a one sub in each corner and be done. <laughs> Makes sense. So Todd, you wanted to talk a little bit about signals, I think, signal types. Oh, I was, yeah, I think I already said it. I was just saying that, yeah, I mean, I, was, I found some interesting things when I really looked at, at in detail at the, at the stimuli, at the uh, stimuli I was using in my study. I mean, I, I kind of already mentioned it, but um, contrived signals, you know, uh, it's kind of in a whole different category. I mean, when, when yeah. in, in my study, I had three, you know, music tracks, which were actually selected out of many to be the, to have the most decorrelation at the times when there was most energy. And for those pe people had a really hard time hearing the difference between a, a front center mono, a front left and right mono, front left and right stereo, and nine plus and minus 90 degrees stereo. They had a, a hard time even just hearing the difference with a very sensitive you know, triangle test, um, much less. I mean, I, we didn't even get into the preference or anything like that. And um, you know, I tried to, I, in the study, I tried to, in any way possible, make it as sensitive as I could. And, and I still basically, except for, again, except for the contrived signal, they, it was very difficult to hear. So that's kind of, you know, why I, I kind of didn't, you know, I just kind of put it to bed for me for, for a while, at least anyway, for a few years, I kind of was able to put it to bed. But I, I still think that, you know, there are, there could be something there if you could solve these other problems. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think the fact that the warble tone is so readily audible tells me that there's something there. Yeah. And and I get that there may be some masking going on in music that makes it harder, but I think the other side of it too um, is for it to exist in the music, it needs to be captured as close to reality as possible. I mean, David got into this idea because he was trying to recreate and recording something that naturally happens in these uh, uh, performance spaces. And uh, he was able to measure it in the performance space. He could show that it existed there. He provides a good theory for why it matters. Uh, in music, if, what I recall from him was that there's very specific stereo recording techniques that are required to capture this correctly. The vast majority of them don't do that. And mm -hmm. uh, then it's impossible to recreate it. Um, I believe binaural recordings would be one example, though, that would correctly. But there were a few others he had mentioned that that also are designed to do that. That is just not how most music's recorded. And then we go to the fact that the vast majority of music that at least Gene and I, I don't know what you listen to, Todd, but the music that Gene and I often listen to, it's its contrived, basically. It's, it's uh, multi-track studio recordings. Everything is recorded in isolation. And then all of the reverb and all of those types of effects that you would get from the room that uh, David was making a big deal about has to actually be added in artificially using things like that lexicon processor he developed. Yep. And so then it's really up to the artists and engineers to care enough to put that in there. there there's one other category that I just was thinking about. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, um, music, uh, symphonic music and that sort of thing. There's one other category, which would be uh, cinemas. Um, a lot of the mm -hmm. tracks that I uh, used for my study were, or at least a couple of them were, were uh, cinema loops. Um, and, and I got that idea from David, actually. He said, uh, you should look there because those, for whatever reason, they tend to be more uh, decorrelated. And, and also in a, in a larger room like that, room modes aren't so much of an issue because there basically are so many of them that were in the statistical region. Yeah, and, the the and stochastic figure, zone goes all the way down to <laughs> the bottom maybe, end, basically. Yeah, so interesting. Maybe that would be an area um, to look into, maybe spatial base, and and it's an area where you really can benefit from being uh, enveloped, too. So, right. Yeah, yeah. I do think I've heard. Um, I we, we probably need some people that are like professional commercial cinema designers to bring on to talk more. But I believe I believe I've heard that there is, um, there are. Uh, zoned subwoofers, basically. Like there is the left side surround subwoofer now i so think in, like, a cinema? In, a in a cinema in a cinema yeah, yeah. I, I believe i had read something that was showing layouts for i'm talking to utah i mean i'm pretty sure Harmon with samsung now has done a whole bunch of work through the the jbl samsung stuff to come up with some new uh commercial cinema layouts that are supposed to be optimized using the new i think it's the onyx screen um and i vaguely yeah. recall seeing a layout that included zone subwoofers for the surrounds and the overhead speakers and things like that 
I don't know. I don't know about that. I know they were doing some experiments with trying to figure out how to get the center channel uh, reflecting, like, yeah, bouncing it off the, from the ceiling and that. But I, I hadn't heard about the subwoofers. I'll, I'll have to look I think they it. were unrelated. I just think that they were trying to uh, offer like a fully optimized well, cinema IMAX, design, and they were showing an the IMAX layout. cinema runs full range speakers. I mean, they run LFE and everything through my understanding. IMAX is different base management than what you would get in a typical cinema layout, and they try to take that spec and bring it into the home audio and they the base oh, manager was a bit base. wonky yeah yeah i never looked at how imax base is it, i've never even used it is it um doesn't i've like never movie. actually played imax stuff through any of my moran stuff i know there's a different base management option once you start playing imax and you can get it to different settings for that because they want you to use full range speakers yeah i have an imax compatible receiver in my family room and i've got the imax content through like disney but yeah I've never really played around with it enough to know if there's like a difference in how it's handling it. I just assumed it was basically DTSX. Yeah. So look, to, to recap, because this was an hour long discussion and I'm not sure if we drove anything home or not, but my understanding from what we talked about is the number one priority should be to control your modal behavior of your room. You're in dealing with small room acoustics. Your bass varies greatly from seat to seat. So if you go start splitting the subwoofer, uh, the base signal to different zones of the room, you're losing that benefit. You're going to have more variability from seat to seat. For something that might not be audible with real program material, it might be audible with warble tones or test tones, but it becomes more ambiguous when you're dealing with music or movie content, especially when you have full range speakers, nine or 11 speakers masking the effect of this. So I really think it's, people shouldn't be stepping backwards. You really need to look at getting the modal behavior fixed in your room first before you start adding more complexity to your system. Would you guys agree with that? There is one other consideration too. Like in my work, I'm always focusing on sort of the social experience where you've got multiple seats. That's how that whole thing came about. But if you're just a lone listener and you're single, you know, money seat, then, then the modal thing is that whole thing Less goes important. away. So, yeah. so then, so in that case, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe that, whatever I said before was not true in that case. I mean, so if you're sitting in that chair, like the Memorex commercial where you're, yeah, if you've got the perfect seat with yeah. the JBL L 100, then you're sitting there with your sunglasses on the winds blowing on you yeah. directional base all day long. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. The, the, what I pointed out to people yeah, well, and it's we've said before, yeah, people have options, they even have presets to play with those options. So yeah. what I've mentioned to people before, though, about the multi sub in a single seat is that sometimes we're restricted in where we can stick that single seat, and we're restricted in where we can stick those subwoofers. And it just ha so happens that that is a really crappy seat for bass. you know, there's just a bad modal yeah. interaction happening right in that issue. Then it matters right in that area. And yeah. then it matters for you. Yeah, that's where multi sub yeah. can kind of help get a wider yeah. zone of smooth, clean bass so that good you point. can place your seat where you can and still get good sound. So yeah. maybe you don't care about your spouse or friends having good bass, but at least you get good bass that way. Yeah. You want to be able to move your head back and forth a little bit. And yeah, good, you know, good bass. <laughs> head head bopping along yeah. to the music. Yeah. And yeah. All right. Well, Todd, I think, I mean, is there anything else you want to add to this or you think this is pretty much a wrap? No, I think it's pretty interesting, and and you know let's uh, let's come back in a, in a couple months or something when you have to get a chance to test this thing, and maybe if there's any new developments with Trinov or Dirac, I'm I'm interested in what they're doing, and maybe we could follow up on it or something. Yeah, and again, I want to shout out to the guys at Morantz and Denon for even having offering this option. The fact that they have multiple products now with four independent subwoofer outputs. Ten years ago, this was not even achievable. I mean. Even unless you had like, I don't even know if Trinov was around 10 years ago with multiple outputs for subwoofers. Were they 10 or 15 years ago? Maybe that was the only way you could get this. I mean, I think there's been through Datasat, I'm trying to think. I think for a little while, at least, there's been some companies that offered processors with what I would call arbitrary channel count. Yeah. Um, where like you could kind of use the MUX to figure out what you want to do with the inputs and it doesn't have to directly match the outputs. Whether that was Trinov or that was, like I said, the data set or the but from a mainstream mic. product, it was yeah, not no, no mainstream yeah. products. I mean, we didn't have 10 years ago, I think two subwoofer outputs that actually were stereo in some way or yeah. discrete, I should say. That was like a big deal, let yeah. alone four. 
Well, yeah. I remember the Denon AVP, which was a seventy-five hundred dollar processor, had three independent subwoofer outputs, and that was like state of the art back then. So yeah. now that we've got four, it's awesome. And there's other brands doing that as well. I even think some of the uh, some of the Arcam stuff has multiple subwoofer outputs now too. They have. So I've run into this multiple times because apparently I can't count. So I have a client, um, and I've now gotten a couple others who emailed me about this same issue. Um, Todd, maybe you know what's gone. Something's gone wrong in our industry. Surround sound by nature is an odd channel count because of the center channel. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow we've gone from odd channel count processors to even channel count processors, which mm -hmm. is causing us to be a channel short often in these scenarios. So the RCAM and the related ones like the JBL synthesis processor that comes from that RCAM are 16 channel processors with 16 out channel outputs, which means that if you do a nine point, uh, I think it was 9.4, Point, or 9.1.4 system, but you want to do the four subwoofers, you're a channel short. Did that have anything to do with like silicon in general? Like the, just the way, no idea. Thing, the way these chips are manufactured or something that they always tend to be even? I don't know. That's that was that's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, you, you could be right. I don't know. But it's something that, that bugs me because you get these people who are like, well, you know, Todd says that you should be running four subwoofers optimally. And they're like, I only have three outputs. Oh, man. Well, we'll make it work anyway. <laughs> So I wanted to bring this up real quick because this is why we haven't experienced IMAX enhanced audio because if we're streaming, we're not getting the IMAX enhanced audio. You're just getting the video portion. Appreciate that, Sad. And I didn't actually, I didn't realize that. I didn't so that, either. All right. So how do we get go. IMAX enhanced audio? Is there any content that has you that? You got to get it? a Blu-ray that has it, I guess. I thought there weren't any. Are there some? I mean, I have a test disc that has some, but I didn't know there were any like produced yeah. movies with it. No. Yeah. I think that you have to get the ultra HD Blu-ray. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate Todd, you coming here, Matt, um, you doing the presentation. I appreciate that as well. We got to have you back, Todd, to talk about our calibration results. Uh, I'm going to have Matt come out here and we're going to do a full Odyssey and a full direct live calibration and, and try to get the house curves to match up and then do a listening comparison to see which room correction system we prefer. Yeah, but yeah, I think we so. should fly Todd out and then we're just going to yeah. do it. A, a cowbell comparison <laughs> that'd be fun well todd has the awesome facility at Harmon. he could be doing this directional base studying for us so i want to give you homework you could set all this up at your place and and bring us more data in fact you guys have processors that i think have direct well maybe not art you guys just got to get a storm processor you have one a which storm storm is the only one that's going to support storm this audio yeah Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know, honestly. All right. Well, go go get one of those, and then uh, yeah, set up your set up like uh, what was it? Twenty subwoofers around the room. <laughs> <laughs> Let the processor go to go to town and see what happens with stereo. Twenty base. year a twenty year um, anniversary uh, thing or something. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, again, guys, I appreciate it, guys. If you like this video, please thumb it up, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.